All right, so we've looked in prior videos at the process of dissolving a solute in a solvent. Well, let's actually look at the factors that determine how much solute we can dissolve. Hello again, my friends. Chemistry Coach coming at you. And I'm going to break this up into two parts. So in this video, we're going to focus on solid solutes only, right? Uh, so we kind of looked at how they dissolve. Let's look at what determines, again, the factors that determine how much can dissolve and some terminology in that. And some graphs. Yay, graphs. We'll do gas solutes in a totally different video for that one because I wanted to get into concentration units, right, uh, to measure how much of a solid uh, or any solute, how much of it actually has dissolved. That's its concentration, right? But let's look at the factors involved in that because that's and I, I think I think you've seen this in your everyday life, experienced it, so this shouldn't be a shocker to you. So the amount of a solid solute that can dissolve in a particular solvent is based on three main factors, okay? First one, which we've looked extensively at, is the identity, right? The molecular, what's the molecular structure of the solute? What's the molecular structure of the solvent, right? Do the Vesper structures, uh, do bond polarities, molecular polarities. Is it polar? Is the solvent polar or nonpolar? Is the solute polar or nonpolar? Does it have hydrogen bonding? Is it just nonpolar with London dispersion forces? All that fun stuff, right? Obviously, that generic term, like dissolves like, the more alike the intermolecular forces, the more you're probably going to dissolve in a particular amount of solvent. Okay? So you're looking at those relative intermolecular forces, and we looked at the energetics of that in the last couple of videos. All right, number two, which you're probably familiar with, is temperature, and that's going to be our main focus for this particular video. I think in everyday life, you kind of realize that as, as you've increased the temperature, you could dissolve more of a solid. I think... I think that's that's fairly, I may not have been consciously aware of it, but just kind of like, all right, that makes sense. So solid solubility tends for the majority of solids. There are some weirdo exceptions to this. Um, some phosphate, ionic, uh, so ionic solids with like, think phosphates and sulfates, maybe arsenates, you know, high three minus charges. Um, those may uh, have slightly opposite trends, but in general, a solid, the amount of solid that you can dissolve in a particular amount of solvent will increase if you jack up the temperature, right? Because you're increasing the thermal or kinetic energy of all the solvent, solute particles. You get the, the increased vibrations in the solute, so it's going to be easier to disrupt those intermolecular forces. Um, if it's in water, those water particles, right, the solvent have higher thermal energy, so they're you know, boom, 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 hitting faster, hitting harder. Would it make sense that that can disrupt those solid lattices? A little bit easier and cause more to dissolve. A third one would be, well, how much solvent do you have, right? I could have a little beaker with 10 milliliters of water and I could dissolve some uh, table salt in there, some sugar, table sugar, and I can dissolve it and then it will stop dissolving at a particular, and once I add enough solid, you'll, you'll see the solid just build up at the bottom and sink. It's like, well, it's not dissolving anymore. Well, if I put 50 milliliters of water in there, I can dissolve a lot more solid. Way well, hey, that makes total sense. So what we're going to do is define solubility as a particular amount of solvent, right? And usually at a particular temperature, because if you just say, what's the solubility of, uh, of sodium chloride? That's a very vague question to a chemist, because a chemist would be like, right? Well, what temperature are you talking about? What solvent are you talking about, right? You got to be very specific as a chemist, right? What's the solvent? How much solvent is there? What's the temperature and what's the solute? Now we can talk numbers. Yeah, let's let's do that in the next, in the next board here. All right, for solubility, we have to be very particular, as we noticed, in our language and our definitions, okay? So I'm going to have to introduce a new concept, which you probably have, have been exposed to, I would imagine, called equilibrium. All right, so the sol when I say, what's the solubility of a solid, right? Well, here's the implications or assumptions behind it. It's the amount or quantity of that specific solute, right, i.e. its concentration. And we're going to go through different, a whole bunch of different concentration units. So depending on what industry, in academics industry, you know, whatever, maybe you work for a specific company that likes the research articles in a very specific type of concentration. What quantity of that solute, what's the concentration, 
in a particular solvent, right, that's normally going to be water. So if there's no solvent mentioned, you have to assume water, right? Because the majority of them are going to be aqueous based solutions. But we could use ammonia, ethanol, I mean, whatever. So, and obviously the solubility will change because if you change the solvent, you're changing the molecular structure, the polarity, the intermolecular forces of attraction. So that will change the amount that you can dissolve. We'll also have to define a specific temperature at what temperature. Now, if somebody doesn't specify a temperature, I guess you could assume room temperature-ish. You know, a lot of tables are at 20 degrees Celsius or 25 degrees Celsius, right? But it makes it a bit of a vague statement, all right? So specific solute, what's its concentration in a specific solvent at a specific temperature, giving a saturated solution. Now, this is that term saturated. You've heard that, oh, my brain's saturated with information, Dr. Locke. Ah, right? <laughs> I, can't, I can't get any more in, right? Saturated means maximum amount, right? So if you have an unsaturated brain, you can, you can get more. If you have a saturated brain, you can't get more. Right. Uh, so let's take a look at, a, at a, a pictorial view on a molecular level or atomic level. Whatever the solid particles are, atoms, ions, molecules, whatever it is. Let's say we got some of that solid and green hair at the bottom of a beaker filled with some solvent, probably water. And so this, as the solid will start dissolving, particles of the solid leave the solid and enter into the water, get hydrated, all that fun stuff, right? So these little green dots are those particles, whether they're ions or molecules or atoms, doesn't matter. So that's our solution. Now, what's saturated mean? As you dissolve more, right, is it possible that as those particles are moving around in the water, they could hit the solid again and be incorporated back into the solid and recrystallize? Yeah, right? So you've got two opposing processes. You've got the dissolving rate. Those are in red arrows. Call that the dissolution rate. How many particles are leaving per second from the solid into the solution, right? But then again, you've got particles in the purple here that are leaving solution and going back into the solid. Oh, no, you've got two opposing processes. Well, as you dissolve more and more solid, the likelihood of more particles going back into the solid increases until those rates will equal each other. Agree? So now visibly what we would see if we had pure water and dumped a solid in there and it's a slightly soluble solid, we would see the amount of solid start to decrease. All right, and then it would just stop at a point. You'd have a, uh, then the amount of solid would appear to be constant to our pathetic human eyeballs on a macroscopic level. But on a microscopic level, there's a lot of motion going on. There's there's particles leaving and coming and leaving and going and leaving and going. When the number of particles leaving the solid into the solution equal the number of particles leaving the solution back in the solid, the dissolution rate equals the crystallization rate. When those are equal to each other, you are at what's called specifically dynamic equilibrium. We just call it equilibrium. At that particular point in time, the number of particles in the solution, i.e. the amount or quantity of solute in that solution, that's the concentration. So the concentration at equilibrium right is called the solubility <gasps> Phew, right now if we increase the temperature right we're going to see more dissolve the solid will decrease more and more and the solubility will increase and we can graph those we're going to get what are called solubility curves that show how the solubility a concentrated solution at equilibrium changes as the temperature goes up we could do that Right? And you could do it for different solvents, too. You could do one in water, one in methanol, one in whatever you want. Right? Um, and then I want to look at some uh, situations. Well, what if you don't have a saturated solution? Right? There's other kinds of solutions. I'm going to write those up on the board uh, next because we're out of room here. Here, so based on our definition of solubility, right, at equilibrium, right, what's the concentration at, uh, for a saturated solution at equilibrium? Um, here's some terms you've probably run into. Let's just kind of define them. This is the official definitions board, right? So again, saturated solution, think of that for a particular solute, particular solvent at a particular temperature, the maximum amount that can be dissolved, right? Up. So commonly what you'd see macroscopically with our pathetic human eyeballs is you might, you know, <clears throat> have some water in a beaker, start dissolving a salt, it dissolves, 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 and then all of a sudden it stops dissolving and then solid starts sinking to the bottom. Um, or you go and grab a, a bottle or something and you see a solution, but you see solid sitting at the bottom. 
for that temperature, that means you probably got the maximum amount dissolved in the solution above it, right? So that would be the solubility of it for a saturated solution, max amount. Well, what if you've got less than that? So let's say you take pure water, start dissolving a solid, and it all goes away, and then you stop, and you don't see any visible solid on the bottom. Well, it means you haven't dissolved enough. You could keep dissolving more, so it's under or unsaturated. That's called an unsaturated solution. You have less than the maximum amount of solute you could dissolve in that particular solvent, that particular amount of solvent at that particular temperature. <gasps> right on? I'm sure you've heard those terms. Like I said, an unsaturated brain. You can get more information in, right? Saturated brain, it's done, <laughs> okay? So really, it seems like those should be the only two options. Either you have the maximum amount dissolved or less than. How could you have more than the maximum amount? That doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. So there's other definitions for this, but I just like this one. So a super saturated, super saturated, right? You ever seen Saturday Night Live? A superstar. Okay, super saturated. That means you can get more. That, that's a solution where you have more than the maximum amount dissolved for that particular temperature. What? How is that possible? These are really fun to do in the lab. So things like, uh, I think it's like, is it sodium acetate or ammonium acetate or something like that? So what you do is you, you can, you know, say make a, you know, say you're at room temperature, you can saturate a solution with it and have a little solid left over and then heat it up to maybe 50 or 60 degrees Celsius. Well, that solid will dissolve because now you've increased the solubility. I'll show you this on the solubility curves in a second uh, on the next board. Um, but at the higher temperature, we can start dissolving more. So sprinkle in more and create a saturated solution at, say, 60 degrees Celsius, a higher temperature. There you go. Okay, we don't see any solid. And then slowly cook, cover it up, make sure no particles can get in there, little hair, or things like that. And slowly, gently, carefully, don't bang in anything, let it cool down to room temperature. So now you have the amount dissolved at a higher temperature, a saturated solution at a higher temperature, but you slowly bring it down to a, a room temperature. And now you have more than you should be able to dissolve at that lower temperature. It's still in there. It's incredibly unstable, but you have more than the maximum amount. Like what? It's called supersaturated, incredibly unstable, and lots of fun. And it will look like an unsaturated solution. You won't see any solid in there. But if you take the layer on the, the top off very carefully and just take one little particle of the solute or anything, like a hair. This was in a movie I saw. Oh my God. It's one of Sandra Bullock's first ones where in the beginning of the movie, they show this high school chemistry teacher. They're in the lab. And you know, they're just, it's kind of, you know, showing who's in the movie and whatnot. And there's a little petri dish which looks like water. Turns out it's actually a super saturated solution. I don't know what it was, probably sodium acetate or something. And then somebody takes a fly and throws the fly into it and just goes, Boom! and it almost, it looks like it immediately all solidifies and surrounds the fly and the fly's alive, going a little, little stuck inside the solid matrix. It was so cool. I've done this in the labs before where I take a super saturated solution in a beaker and I pour it into a, a Petri dish. So it's a liquid as I pour it. And then as it hits, it solidifies. And as I keep pouring, you see this pile of solid that just goes, and I form the little arches with these solids of the super saturated solution because you just sometimes you just bang it or put one little you know seed particle in there condensation nuclei and boom the whole thing just solidifies out right <laughs> lots of fun all right so we're not going to deal with super saturated solutions in this case let's look at saturated solutions and let's plot the concentration of a saturated solution for a given amount of sol uh, solvent uh, at particular temperatures. And we can plot that, right? We could do that in lab. We can say, hey, let's take 100 mils of water or 200 grams of water or one gallon or wh whatever you define as. Um, so, and, and then let's, let's set it at a specific temperature and measure the mass, say usually in grams, of solid that can dissolve and, and, and form a dynamic equilibrium and form a saturated solution. And let's maybe do that at 20 degrees Celsius. Let's do it at 25 degrees Celsius. Let's do it at 30 degrees Celsius. Let's keep the amount of solvent to the same and see how that solubility increases with time and let's plot that curve. That's a solubility curve. Now, it looks a lot like vapor pressure curves that we did before uh, in certain scenarios. All right, so imagine we go to lab <clears throat> and let's pick some amount, a set amount of solvent, right? So let's say 100 grams of water, right? Or 100 milliliters or one liter. You can pick any amount, but a lot of the solubility curves that I see have the grams of solute over 100, per 100 grams of water as the concentration unit uh, 
at equilibrium, right, for the solubility. So it's a plot of the solubility of the solute, right, in the given amount, typically 100 per one gram, how many grams of solute per 100 grams of water, right, at a particular temperature range. So let's say we do it at zero degrees Celsius. Measure the concentration of that saturated solution, right, uh, or how many grams we can. We keep doing 100 grams of water as an example. And then we do it again at, say, five degrees Celsius, then 10, then 50, and 25, all the way to, say, 100. Right? That'd be a good day, days long, and you know, try to be as, as uh, you know, accurate as possible. And then we can plot that. Now, let's say we do this for potassium bromide. That's the solubility curve for potassium bromide. If I did, say, you know, sodium nitrate, right, it may be more soluble, right? Obviously, it depends on the lattice energy, the side, the bigger the ions, the more soluble, soluble, you know, Coulomb's law, right? So the bigger the ion size, the more soluble it's going to be, the smaller the charge, the more soluble. If this was, you know, magnesium phosphate, it's probably not going to be as soluble, the higher charges and whatnot. So you might see some do like this. You might some have, some have different slopes. Some might curve a little bit. So they're each, each solid is going to have its own unique solubility curve. But it's just as a summary of all the information we need. But you could read off this graph and say, hey, at zero degrees Celsius, what is the concentration of a saturated solution of potassium bromide? You can go, well, it's about 60 grams of potassium bromide per 100 grams of water. Right? And you say, well, what if we're at roughly room temperature, 25 degrees Celsius? You just go up and over and go, da 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 Well, you're probably pushing 70. If this is 50, 100, 150, you're probably pushing about 70 grams, right? It goes up maybe 10 grams. And then you can go to 50 degrees Celsius and 75. And 100 degrees Celsius, you're about 110 grams, right? Give or take. It's an approximate that you're reading, probably only good to the nearest one gram, probably not the decimal places off a graph, right? And obviously, I drew this by hand. It's, probably, it's not super, super accurate. But it gives you a rough idea of how you can get information from that. But watch what happens. Along that green line is the saturated solution. So at this temperature, that's the concentration of a saturated solution, right, at equilibrium. But for example, we talked about in the last board, what if we went to, say, 100 degrees Celsius, right, and saturated the solution at about 110 grams? of potassium bromide and then slowly cooled it right what if we slowly cooled it into this region now we would be above the line right as long as we were able to not let it solidify out so this would be the un uh, not un this would be the super almost got that backwards So anything above this line, this is the saturated solution, anything above it would be the super saturated solution. So you would have more than the max. So we might have 110 grams dissolved, say at 75 degrees Celsius, when it really should only be about 95. Like, whoa. And then if you add one particle, it just goes boom and drops right immediately, right? You would just go boom and drop to that saturated line right there. Super saturated solutions are fun. Now below here, so let's, you know, so if we were at a particular temperature, but we didn't have enough to form a saturated solution, this would be the unsaturated region. Easy peasy, right? So along the line, you've got a saturated solution. That's what we're going to call the concentration, right? Or solubility of the solid. Above it is the supersaturated solution. Below that is the unsaturated region or an unsaturated. So if we're down here, we could just keep at a particular temperature, we could just add more and more and more and more and more. So if we start here, if we start here, right, we added this amount of solid, it's just all dissolved. We can't see any more solid. So we could keep adding more solid until we hit that line. And then we got a saturated solution. And if we keep adding more at that temperature, it'll just sink, assuming it's more dense than water, it would just sink to the bottom and pile up at the bottom and you could see a saturated solution, right? And like I said over here, if you're at some higher temperature and you slowly cool it, you now have a super saturated solution. And again, if you add something to it, it will almost immediately collapse to a saturated solution. Right ho, my friends. Not too bad, so that's solid solubility. What I want to get into now is talk about different concentration units.
right? This one's typically, I've, I've only seen this one typically for sol, uh, solubility curves specifically. Um, but I want to do kind of a, show you how to, a quick review of what we probably looked at at intro chemistry and first semester of general chemistry with molarity, normality, all that kind of stuff. And then introduce a few new concentration units we're going to be using later on down the road as for when we talk about specific solution properties. And then we'll get into the solubility of gas solutes, which there's a slight twist to those uh, versus a solid solute. All right.